we are looking at Taylor polynomials and remainders for functions of um, multiple variables. If we have time, we will look at positive and negative uh, definite matrices and how they're related to the second derivative test. Okay. But I think most of the time we'll spend on Taylor polynomials. Uh, well, for Dr. McCohen, it is going to be uh, two on uh, Mondays. For Dr. K, it's going to be either 10 a.m. or 11 a.m. We don't know yet. We have to decide tomorrow, but it's going to be tomorrow. All right, so what was I talking about? All right, so talking about uh, Taylor polynomials, and there's some notation. So you agree that uh, in the book, this means the derivative of f uh, with respect to the first coordinate. So it's just a partial derivative, right? Also, Mr. Liz, uh, uh, do you, so are, like when you do this weekly rerouting, are you going to review what we have covered in lecture or what we will cover in lecture? Uh, I do not know, just because I don't see his notes. Um, so I just will, you typically look at the homework and I decide, well, that's what we should be talking about. Okay, so because on the homework, we just uh, started, uh, we actually finished uh, Taylor's polynomial with single variable. Yeah. So I think we will be covering the multivariable next tomorrow. Tomorrow. Oh, so you don't want to talk about it? Oh, I, I actually do want to talk, like, like want you to talk about it. Because I, oh, okay. I want something preview for tomorrow's lecture. Okay, okay. Yeah, this works well. This works well. I, I, I just finished my physics lab and I, I rushed here. I thought this would be like, a room of people like no, nobody really shows up. But oh, so, great, in the Edwards book, if you can see that they, they use uh, that notation right to mean partial derivative with respect to x one, and this is more common right notation. And then, um, so d sub i we know means the derivative of your function with respect to the I coordinate. So, uh, can you guess what this means? In Edward's book. This is the uh, the the third partial derivative of second x. Yeah, so it's the uh, third order derivative of f with respect, so it's third order, I said, okay. with respect to the second coordinate. Well, I have a question. Yeah. Is this being recorded? Yeah. Okay. So we're going to be using this kind of notation and maybe, so in general, d e sub i power k, the superscript k, I should say, of f. Just means the kth derivative of f with respect to the i coordinate. So kind of, in this case, I kind of like Edward's notation. Okay, and if you have, if you have like d1, d2, cubed, right, of some function, uh, this means differentiate three times with respect to the second coordinate, and then take the result and differentiate it with respect to first coordinate. Okay. So we typically can write this as yeah, that's it's written this way. So we're going to need to have this notation for a Taylor polynomial, a Taylor expansion. Okay. So next, there's then they use this notation in the book, the derivative of f in the direction of vector h. Okay. And the way we want to think of that is that this is the same thing as uh, h1 times the derivative with respect to the first coordinate 
plus H2 with respect to the, and then times the derivative with respect to the second coordinate and so on, all the way through all, you know, all the spatial coordinates. And it's acting in function F. So. I guess I can just use shorthand. We know it's a function of x. So this is uh, the derivative of f with respect to x1, the derivative of f with respect to x2, and so on. Yes? So on the d sub h, so h is a vector. Oh, yeah, so that's the next, I guess I already I used H, but didn't really define it. And I should, I'm going to stop using this bar notation. We should know from context whether, uh, so F is a function for us, a real value function from Rn into R. So when we say uh, X, right, that's in the domain, we mean it's a vector in Rn. And likewise, H will be a vector in Rn. That's right. We're also, uh, we'll have for Taylor expansion, we'll have a center. So uh, sometimes the book calls that just A. Yes. Okay. And then we have a point, it's close to A, say, call it X. Right? So you have A. I said, I just said I wouldn't use the bars. I'm so used to that. So we have center and a point in space. And x minus a is the displacement, right, as you go from a to x. Uh, so that's what we're calling h. And so sometimes you'll see this written as a, the center. You move over, you, just, you displace yourself by vector h, and you end up in a new point, a plus h. Okay. So x is the same as a plus h. So or in like this it. case, x and a are both vectors. Everything here is a vector because this is a, this is a, this is happening in the domain of the function r n. So all points are of importance. Well, I, I have one question. So yeah. well, from third column from the bottom, d sub h f x equals to the semi like like parentheses uh, and then times yes. f x. Yes. Is it is it is it like this whole thing? Times f of x. Yeah, so this is a differential operator. Differential operator. So it means anything that comes across, it takes the derivatives, right? So it's coming across f, and you can kind of distribute that if you will to get. So here, all I did was just distribute f, so to speak. This is the way that operator is defined. Okay, but what this allows for is some very compact, nice notation because Taylor polynomials look ugly otherwise. So well, can, do I, can I think of whatever is the principle? Can I think of the, it is the matrix of H times the matrix of D? So that gives No, 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 no. So, yeah, so be careful. H, this is why it's dangerous. So, H is a vector in Rn. H consists of n coordinates. H1, H2 through Hn. So here, these H's are number that. Uh, oh, where is it? Oh, yeah. Uh, so here, um, H is a vector, but its coordinates here are just numbers. So those are just the coordinates of vector H. So they're just numbers. So are these H1, H, Hn? Same as the matrix of H1, H2, Hn. I mean, the same thing. Uh, so H by itself is a vector with n coordinates. The coordinates we're calling H1 through Hn. Yeah. So you so you see that like, like there is a H equals to a matrix H1, H2, H, Hn. So are they the same thing as on the left side H1, H2, H1 times D1? H2 times D2, Hn times Dn. Like, are these H1 to 1 to N same as? Same thing? Are they the same thing? As what, though? So, do you see? Uh, okay, can I call it here? Yep. So, my question is this H1, yeah. H1, H2, Hn, are they the same 
matches with this? Yes, yes. Same yes. As well. okay. So, I uh, should have maybe. So, here's so the vector h, and these are its points. All right, so next, if you want to have notation for a second order derivative, you would say it's the derivative of the second order derivative of f in the direction of vector h. Okay. And the way we're going to define this is a very neat way. So we know that d sub h is like this operator, right? And then we're going to square that and then uh, apply that to function f. So just simply squaring it. Simply squaring it. Uh, but let's just uh, let's look at an example because uh, this I'm maybe starting off at the wrong end or the abstract end, and I should be looking at concrete example first to see how this. Let's do that. So let's just consider the function something simple like x squared y cubed, right? So that's a function from R2 into R. Okay. We're going to choose a center, say uh, center is negative 1, 1. And we're going to be looking for the third order Taylor polynomial. Then we'll also look at the remainder. Now, I'll show you a very kind of a tricky way of doing this, right? Well, so the, the, the way it should look like is it's just the function at the center, first, right? First of all, that's the zeroth order term. And then you're going to have the second order term. So it's the, uh, the first order term, I apologize. So it's the der derivative of f. In the direction of h plus the derivative, second order derivative of f. And then, of course, I'm forgetting something. Do you see what it is? So you're for the rx, right? The error approximation. Yeah. Well, um, I'm forgetting to divide by factorials. And also, I should be writing that this is the Taylor polynomial of third degree. As a function of h, okay. where h is a vector, which is just the same thing as arbitrary point minus the center. So that's going to be x minus a negative 1. And then this is going to be y minus 1. So I'll first, do a, we'll get the correct answer very quickly by doing something tricky. Oh, I'm still forgetting to divide by factorials here. So this is a roundabout way of finding this third degree polynomial. Simply introduce x plus 1 and y minus 1 by doing this, x plus 1, and then, of course, you don't want to change the value of your function. Then y minus 1 and plus 1, you don't want to change them. So now we're just going to kind of keep lump these into a new term, and then we can square. Here you have the cube. Okay. 
and then multiply this out. All right, so I'm going to start at the end here. So uh, one times one. Well, okay. why do I want to do that? Okay, so I want to get the constant term. So you have one times one. And then we're going to have, uh, I'll just do it in order. Okay. I'll just rearrange it later. Yeah. So since we have x plus 1 equals to h1 and y minus 1 equals to h2, can you just replace h1? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was going to do that. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, for sure. And you, you're right. It would be more efficient to do it right now, but. Now I want to distribute the next term. And the last term. All right, so now we're going to collect the zero order terms. Okay, so zero order terms are just the constants, right? So we have one. Okay, so that takes care of this business here. Now, which of these are the first order terms? Let's do that in yellow. Uh, the combined degree of a term uh, is where you add. So if we look at this really quickly, what's the combined degree of this? Well, five. Five. Okay, so that's, that's, that's a fifth order term. What do I undo here? So the first order terms are here. So you get this, and that's it. There's one first order term. Even though there should be two of them, right? Oh, there it is. Okay. So we're going to get minus 2 times x plus 1 plus 3 times y minus 1. Okay. So that takes care of the, the first order terms. That's going to, so you see what's going to happen. I uh, just so you, uh, this one here is going to match the zeros. It's going to be the function at negative 1, 1. Uh, so this one is going to be this, the zeroth order term. It's just going to be the function of negative one one. Now this, these are, this is the first order terms, right? So that's going to correspond to the first derivative. But we'll see that. All right, so then what about the third order terms? See, did it, here's one. Oh no, second order. What am I doing, right? Why did I? So first, see, first order now second order. Right here, and here, and here. This is going to be a, the second order term is going to be very important because it's going to be used in the second derivative test later on. Yep. All right. So that takes care of this. Now the third order terms. Uh, so that's a third order term. So it's this, and so it's this.
groups. All right. Now, what's the what's the, now? I'm, I'm, we're looking for a third order Taylor polynomial, right? So notice that all the other terms are have an order higher than higher than three. So if you lump those together, they'll actually become a remainder in the Taylor the error. But here I'm claiming that now if I uh, now, if I substitute, right, as you said, x plus 1 is just h1. And y minus 1 is just h2. H2 cubed. So I'm claiming that's our Taylor polynomial of order 3. Okay. And now what we're going to do is that compute this directly by taking of our function. And I already took the derivatives, if you don't mind, because I don't want to take time taking derivatives. So remember our function whatever it is x squared y cubed. So the function at negative 1, 1, remember our center is negative 1, 1, is just 1. All right, now let's compute the first derivative in the direction of h. So we said that that's going to be Now, this is a function of just two variables, so this is going to be easy enough. And that's going to be evaluated at negative 1, 1. All right, so I computed the derivative with respect to x and y. Okay. So now we're going to evaluate them at negative 1, 1. So this would be... Uh, Negative two and this would be three. Okay, so this is going to become uh, this evaluated negative one one is negative two, and that's multiplying h one. And this becomes three multiplying h two. Okay, so notice that's a uh, that corresponds to these two terms. All right, uh, so that takes care of, we have our constant and we have our first order term. So that by itself is a first order, to, this by itself is a first order Taylor polynomial, right? very linear approximation to the function. All right, so now we wanna look at the second derivative in the direction of h of our function. So this is h1 differential uh, de de derivative operator h2 d2 squared. All right, so what could this possibly mean? Um, well, when you just use final, uh, uh, foil this out, so you get h1 squared d1 squared, except d1 is an operator, right? So that just means you differentiate twice. Right. And then this, uh, if you, you know, do the middle terms, you get two times h1, d1, d2. So what, what's happened? What happened? Uh, well, all I'm doing is just saying a plus b squared is a squared plus 2ab plus b squared. 
Do you not have two H1, H2, D1, D2? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Thank yeah. you. I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. And that's going to be acting on F. And then we're going to evaluate that at one, negative 1, 1. So we need the second order derivative. So I computed those again as well. Uh, this was 2y cubed. And then the mixed order partial. We're assuming that our function is smooth enough that, so that this is the same as uh, if you change the order of differentiation, right? And then that's going to be 6xy squared. Is it? Right, and then evaluating at the specific point, we get um, 2, 6, and negative 6. Right. So this should be, let me write it out. All right, so we have the this guy, and that's just two. And then this is uh, negative six. And this is six. Okay. So that should give us these guys, except uh, why is there a discrepancy? I'm going to go ahead and uh, look at the second order terms that we got by using that trick of expansion and versus the derivative. Why is there a discrepancy there? This is the second, so we take the factorial, right? You have to divide by two factorial, exactly. We haven't done that yet here, right? So, uh, two factorial. so if we take uh, the second derivative of f, and divide by 2 factorial, and we just get h1 squared minus 6, h1, h2, plus 6, ah, 3. And now that exactly matches what we got here. And then we have the uh, third order derivative in the direction of h. So that would be h1 d1 plus h2 d2 cubed acting on f and then we're just going to evaluate this as negative 1 1. So if you do the binomial expansion for this it would be h1 cubed d1 cubed. Are you familiar with this? Uh, I, I remember that go 1 1 1 1 2 1 one, three, yeah, that three, one. one. Pascal's, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Oh, that's the tedious process. It is, but that's something that needs to get messy. That's why, in a sense, this notation is a, if you know how to unpack it, it's a, it saves, what do you do, like, it saves formula? Yeah. Saves, yeah. Uh, and that's going to be acting on F, so I'll just write that in there so I don't have to do it again. Right, so these are all third order derivatives. So we need uh, the third order derivative with respect to x, which uh, happens to be 0, right? Uh, we need this. Skip this stuff here. This is actually 12xy. 
right? But then we're, we, would, we would be evaluating this at our specific center, so 0, 6, negative 12, and 6. Okay, so now let's see, uh, that becomes zero. This is six times three is 18. And then this is negative 12 times three is negative 36. Up, and then we have six. Okay. And of course, this doesn't quite match what we have here. But then, of course, if we look at the formula for the Taylor polynomial, there we should be dividing the third order term by three factorials. By six. So dividing this by six, uh, that would match. Sorry about that. Jumpy, very jumpy. Okay, so this matches exactly. Uh, what we think the third degree term should be. All right, so that would be our third degree Taylor polynomial. Okay. Now, before I start talking about remainder, I will show you uh, an important, uh, okay. Another way to think of it, is the, especially for second order, you're gonna have your function at the center And then you're gonna have your first derivative. And so the way you can think of that is that it's just the uh, derivative with respect to x, derivative of f with respect to y, uh, at a, b, oh my gosh, all this notation. And that would be multiplying h like so. So this is uh, the first order Taylor polynomial. To get the second one, uh, not that it matters, but. And this is being evaluated at A, B. So I'll just write it this time. This would be the second order together. Let's see how this works. Yeah. So I understand the first term. And on, on the right side of the plus, plus H1, H2, and then the Hesher matrix, yeah. and then H1, H2. Where is that left H1, H2 coming from? H1, H2. Oh, uh, we'll multiply it out. We'll, we'll see. But notice that this is just H1, D1 of F, right? Oh, I forgot. This is divided by 0 factorial. This is divided by 1 factorial. I'm always forgetting even 2 factorial. So, this, so again, I should say that this is the second order Taylor polynomial. My question was, uh, yeah. why is there... Why is there H1, H2 and not here? I understand this H1, H2, but I don't understand why there is H1, H2 here. Uh, so this is another important topic in this section, right? section 8 and section 7, 8, I forget. But it's uh, called the quadratic form. 
And well, you'll see why it comes out to be the second the second order derivative stuff. So, uh, all right. So this would be h two times d, right? Uh, so notice that this is exactly what we meant by the, the derivative of f in the direction of h at some point. Now, so the second term, uh, if you do this multiplication of matrix with column vector there, and then do the row vector times column vector multiplication. Let's see what happens. All right, so H1 times the first entry. Plus, and now H2 times the second entry. So now these two middle terms, we're assuming that our function is smooth, right, enough so that the mixed partials are equal. So those middle terms actually double up. So there would be two of them and you're multiplying by a half. So I'll just leave the one half out there actually. So if you take out the f, you see that this is exactly uh, 1 over 2 factorial, and this is exactly what we mean by h1 d1 plus h2 d2 squared, right? Because it's just you squared, okay, squared, sorry. So this is uh, the second order derivative in the direction of h of f at d. So you see this so often, I thought I would mention it. And it's also important, this part, as I said, second order term is important because it's using the second derivative test. It's called a quadratic form. The second order term, right? Squares. Uh, okay. So, for example, Uh, suppose we have uh, this function. Well, actually, let me do this. Do I have the original? Let's do x squared, just to make a point, x squared uh, plus y minus 1 squared plus 2 times 
z plus one squared. So this was my original function. Now, can you tell me where this function attains a uh, extrema and whether it's a max or a min just by looking at the function? Uh, zero, one, negative one. Yeah. It's a minimum. That's uh, correct. The function should be something like uh, some sort of elliptic paraboloid yeah, like with the vertex at zero, yes. one, and one, a negative one. Yeah, that's right. Okay. All right. So now, what if you find what if you were to find a Taylor? Now it's expansion around. Right. Let's find the Taylor expansion, right? At uh, say the origin. The origin. Which we want. So, right, I just multiply this out. And uh, what if you found, uh, what's the, uh, and suppose we expand about this center, right? What would the function at 0, 1, negative 1 be? Negative 1. Negative 1. Well, it would be 0, I believe. Plus 2, 2, 5, 2, 1, 1. It should be 1. It should be 0. Look at the original expression for the function. Oh, yeah, it should be zero. Sorry. It should be zero. Alright. All right. Now, what if we uh, found the first derivative? Yes, right. All right, so this would be uh, h1 and then the derivative of f with respect to x. Um, so that would be zero. So this will not have a plus h3d sub 3 f. 2 minus 2? 4. 4z uh, plus 4. Okay. And now remember, we're going to be evaluating the stuff at our center. Zero, zero, negative, zero, zero, zero. Yeah. What, and why is that surprising to you? Oh, it is surprising because the gradient should be equal to the zero. Yeah, we, zero, we, we, we see that that should be an extrema, right? So it should be zero. All right. And what about the second order derivative? Well, it should be let's say square by yeah. And so we could right multiply this out 
kind of annoying, right? But remember that we said that this should correspond to. Well, that uh, H1, H2, H3 with the Hessian matrix. Mm -hmm. And then H1, H2, H3. Yeah. So at least when you're doing second derivative, if you use this convention, it might be simpler. Well, what just happened? All right, fine. All right, so here we're going to get the. Uh, Right, but these partial derivatives are pretty easy to compute. Let me just write them. So the second derivative of f with respect to x would be 2. And then we have with respect to y, with respect to z. The derivative of that with respect to x, y, and z. And the derivative of this with respect to x, y, and z. Oh. And if you multiply this out, well, no, we can talk about this, this quadratic form later. But it turns out that you just get the diagonal entries, right? You're going to get 2 times h1 squared, 2 times h2 squared, plus 4 times h3 squared. All right, so now if we do a Taylor polynomial of degree 2, It should be this over zero factorial. factorial, then this over one factorial it's still zero. plus this over two factorial. Now, all right, and then we get so divided by two factorial. So we see that our second degree polynomial. Right. And then how is this related to the original function? Yeah, this well, is before. H1 is, H1 is x1 minus a. Yeah. And then h2 is y minus yeah. b. And then, and then so we have exactly what we have over here. Yeah. Yeah, so h1 is just x minus 0, h2 is uh, y plus 1, minus 1. Mm. Right, so we just get the function back. And so why this Taylor polynomial is equal to the function if you center it at that critical point. So why would that be? I mean, well, the function is a, it's a second degree polynomial. So you expect the second degree Taylor polynomial to match it. Now, how can we reason, how do you reason that this is, uh, this is going to be a minimum? And it's uh, because this function, this quadratic form, always returns a uh, positive, uh, positive number, right? Well, because from the Hessian matrix, we can know it's positive. Definite. And then, uh, yeah. the, the, uh, fxx, fxy, fx, like, like that is always positive, and then the, uh, that, that, that turns out to be positive, so positive positive is going to give a minimum. Yeah, it's a positive definite matrix. Positive, yes. Yeah. Okay, so we know that the, by the second derivative test, we should get a minimum at our critical point, and we do. Um, I guess we should talk about the remainder, right? So what can I say? All right, let me show you, give you another tip, at least for the homework. So so annoying. This is really helpful. Yeah. All right. So we're going to have a 
uh, what's the, we have a function. Uh, X is a vector. And we have the Taylor polynomial. So I'll write this like so, just so it's consistent. It's going to be the Taylor polynomial of kth degree acting on H, function of H, and the remainder. So what property does the remainder mu must have? Did we already talked about it. Well, the remainder is just a discrepancy between the function and the Taylor polynomial. If we divide this by the magnitude of h to the power k, we want our remainder to have the property that this will go to zero as h goes to zero. So that's an important property of the uh, And so where I was going to go with this is just demonstrate how, it, so, da, 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 da. yeah, so uh, let's do this. Do you know the expansion for e to the t about zero, right? The Taylor expansion for e, e to the t. T to the n divided by n factorial. Have you seen that? Okay, yeah. So. Plus the remainder. Well, that's an infinite series. So, what if you want to know you have a function of two variables? let's say e to the x times y squared, and you wanted to know the expansion of this uh, centered at the origin, because that's going to be right? Well, you can take advantage of the one variable Taylor expansion centered at the origin. Because t is any real number, right? This converges for any real number. So, x times y squared is a real number, so we can just replace t with it. So if I do a, just remember, you know, this is t, right? So you should get 1 plus t plus half of t squared and so on. Yeah. But e to the t equals to submission of n to infinity t, t to the n over n factorial. Yeah. Is that just a formula that you remember? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Uh, he, he typically derived it in one variable calculus at some point, calculus 2 or something, but it's a famous one that they assume you know that one and you know the expansion for cosine and sine. And so this would go on, right, forever and ever. So if I, if somebody asked me, what is the second or uh, what is the second degree Taylor polynomial of this function centered at the origin? What would you, uh, of this infinite series, what would you highlight? The first three. 1 plus x y squared plus 1 over half x squared y is 40. What time did we start? 2? Uh, I came in uh, around 2.30. Okay. So uh, let me right. so, just erase that real quick. Well, if I highlight this term, what order would you say it has? 3. So if I just want the second order Taylor polynomial. It's just one? Yeah. Because there, there are no second order terms, right? So for this function, it's 
expanded about zero, we'd get the, I guess, the, the second order, right? And the remainder, so this would be P2. Uh, at X and Y. Here I can use X and Y instead of H1, H2. Do you see why? It's in there at zero, zero. Yeah, so this is the same as. So you'll, that you'll see this interchange. That's why it's so confusing. You have to kind of see that X and Y are like H1, H2, just because you centered at the expansion at the origin. All right, and then this then must be the remainder. Nice. Okay, so likewise, if I ask for the third order Taylor polynomial and the remainder, that's going to be the more, I guess, more interesting here. Uh, I wouldn't, well, the the first order, a uh, third order, you just include the terms through the third order. Right? So you would include all those. Third order. And then the rest is a remainder. Yeah, the higher order terms are going to be the remainder. Oh. So do we not have something similar to, uh, to the remainder of single variable complement? A, a single, single variable filler. Yeah, but so for uh, single variable, I have the remainder to be one over k factorial f to the k. Yeah, 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 yeah. Value. So here, uh, r just means remainder, right? Yes. But you can prove that there is a form of the. Uh, you can express the remainder in terms of the original function. Oh. So the k remainder, right? Kth order remainder is uh, going to be the k plus one derivative of f in the direction of vector h, okay, and that's going to be uh, you're going to evaluate this at some point where here you have to remember that here's a here's let's say a plus h right so this is a this here is vector h. And we we need this thing to be somewhere on that line segment between. And then you divide by k plus one factorial. So that's a theorem. That's a one way to express the remainder. Okay. Uh, do I not uh, do I not have x? Well, this is acting on h. Right. So you have to remember that the h part is in is already in there. Do I have h to the k plus 1 power? Well, it is. Okay, so let, let's do this. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I wanted to show you that this remainder has this property. That if you divide by the magnitude of h or x here, right, and y cubed, that uh, as we go to the as x and y go to the zero, this goes to zero as well. Just some of the things you kind of tip the basic kind of operations needs to do so. Uh, what is the magnitude of uh, cube? So that's going to be x squared plus y squared square rooted, and then cubed. Okay. So let's just, let's say, we just look at the first term, right? So how can we show that the limit of this, at least the first term, as we go to the origin is zero? Uh, I can divide both sides by, uh, let's say, uh, divide both sides by uh, x squared. Wait, I, I should divide both sides by uh, uh, 
x cube and then uh, y cube. That works. Also, make the denominator smaller. Yeah, that's probably a better way. Okay. Yeah, I, uh, so <clears throat> I could have done this. I, uh, you can prove that, let's say. Uh, because uh, y squared is smaller than x squared plus y squared, you take the square root uh, cube of both sides. And then divide. So what you can do is just use kind of squeeze theorem here. Take the absolute value. Well, it's all positive, so it doesn't matter. And think of this as the magnitude of y times uh, y, the magnitude of y cubed. The y to the fourth. Because then this, we know, this expression is going to be less than or equal to 1. So now as you take the limit of both sides as uh, we go to the um, we see that uh, since the bigger thing goes to 0, the smaller thing is going to go to 0 as well. And you can prove this for each one of these terms, right? So that we, this will go to zero as we go to the origin. Uh, probably the easier thing to do would be to say uh, y squared is smaller than well. And then uh, raise both sides to the power of three halves. And this is a, I should be talking absolute value here, so. So this whole denominator can be replaced with something. smaller, that's making the whole fraction larger. It's the same thing, so I don't know. Okay, anyway. But the remainder has that property, so I just want to demonstrate. Right. Well, uh, I need to get down to the lab, actually. I'm going to go work downstairs. Okay, thank you. Right. Thank you. Sure. I hope just at least cleared up some of the notation might be not so poor. Can I ask you one thing? Yeah. So because like the reason why I came in late is because I have a lab that starts at one PM. Yeah. And uh, like I finished within like an hour, an hour and a half. Uh, like if there is uh, no other people like, coming to this 